Where arts and culture summits the airwaves, this is the Nine Rails Arts Podcast. I'm Art Brandon Long alongside Todd Opendorfer, and we are the Banyan Collective, arts and adventure podcasting since 2010. This episode includes an interview with Russ Adams of Ogden Uncon. Russ is an award-winning special effects artist familiar to worldwide audiences for his work on Jim Henson's Creature Shop Challenge, the highly rated sci-fi challenge reality series. We discuss Ogden's Uncon, Ogden's untamed and unconventional pop culture convention, Coming up this June seventh through 9th. Just too good old boy. Never mean it no harm. Beats all you ever saw. Been in trouble with the law since the day they were born. Straight in the curve. Flat in the hill. Someday. Making their way the only way to allow. That's just a little bit more. Well, our house man nailed it once again. Good old Not boys. Only, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not only do I love that song, this old Waylon Jenny song. I think if you listen to the lyrics, that song is written about you and I. It is. It is. Yeah. Tan Van is the car. Is <laughs> it, it, it is. I don't think it could jump as many of the rivers and things like that as the General Lee could, but I'm willing to give it a shot. That's what I, I was just going to say. Let's let's not go there. Let's let's do it first and see what Tan Van can handle. You know, let's let's go there for so huge shout out uh, to the proper way. Thank you for our. Our, int- our intro song and these fun ditties they do for us. Yeah. Thank you, boys. Uh, excellent work. Excellent work. And uh, where are we hanging out today? We are uh, at Kappa on 25th Street. We mm-hmm. are sharing a plate of cookies. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I haven't had a bite yet, though. Yeah. We're going to get to those. I think they're maple cookies. Yes. And I think you got a drink. What are you drinking today? I did. I uh, went with a caramel latte with almond milk. Yeah. To start so, my Sunday. Here. I think that's a perfect way to start a Sunday morning. Yeah. Not too bad. Uh, we sat down with, uh, now, Russ Adams is on the uh, Arts Advisory, advisory Committee, committee with, with us. us yes. Right. And, uh, and it says here that he he was, uh, he was rose to fame quickly on the Jim Henson's Creature Shop Challenge uh, <laughs> because he was a fan favorite on the show, thanks to his quick wit and willingness to help his fellow contestants. The quick wit, I get... I'm going to agree with that. You're going to agree with that? I'm going to agree with that, but his willingness to help others. <laughs> I don't know. That kind of remains to be seen. I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure he's going to appreciate us saying that as well. So uh, It was a really good interview. We, we go in, in deep there on just what he does and how he became an artist along with um, what's why is the Ogden Uncon different? And it and it is. And I didn't know until he, but he explains No, this was why. an important conversation. Yeah. It went from zero to, I think, 50 minutes. In less than 50 minutes. I think we could have just kept talking. It went by really fast. So, again, Ogden's Uncon is coming up June 7th through 9th. And uh, this is an interview with Russ Adams, who is in charge of everything, so that you'll learn everything you need to know about Ogden's Uncon. Are you recording? Yeah. Okay, so... Get up on that, though, because... Yeah, so... So we have to get on top of Yesterday... You, not so much. Okay, good. But uh, that's for sure. Um, Are we good? Yeah. Okay, so... You know, the weather yesterday wasn't great. Um, it was supposed to be great in my head. So I teach two classes this semester. I'm teaching a drawing class and a studio art for the non-art major class. And so I was so excited. I was going to bring the students downtown. I was going to have them draw. We were going to meet at the, at the Monarch, you know, surrounded by the mural up there. And, uh, anyway, rained out, weathered out. It just, it was like a hundred percent chance of rain. I'm like, let's not do that. So, so we went back, uh, to Although school. That is a new skill. What to, is to draw in the rain and the yeah, like, like a little bit of mist would be fine, but uh, and the fact that I th- 
think for one of the classes we were going to use some watercolor pencils, mm. which would completely just extra skill. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which I guess would have been okay for watercolor paints. You know, Maybe. if it had been raining yeah. or something. You just dip your brush on. Right? But anyway, <laughs> did the old last minute plan, and so for my drawing class, uh, for our final project that's due last week, uh, two weeks of school. I'm so excited to be done. Oh, I need a break so bad. I'm sure the students need a break too. Uh, anyway, so our final drawing is a surrealist piece, right? And so I wanted to pick a surrealist film, so I kind of go through some things. I was going to go old obscure, um, but I ended up going with the 1985 Terry Gilliam Brazil, which is amazing and completely out there. Have you guys Wait. seen Brazil? You've seen Brazil. Oh, Brazil's so the name of the film? Yeah, it's a Terry Gilliam piece. You said... Which one did you just mention a second so, ago? Gods must be you crazy. You said Time Bandits. Time Bandits. See, same guy, um, yeah. just done, or probably around that time period. But uh, I hadn't seen Brazil in about 15 years, and it was brilliant. Like, so good. Are you really good cast. Not with that one, no. Um, Robert De Niro's in there. I've forgotten that he was in that. Oh, so, so, so good. But uh, a lot of, um, you know, obviously the image is just whack. I mean, that's the whole point, kind of, with those things. But. Uh, a lot of practical effects in those. And so that's kind of a nice little lead into this. Uh, so we are talking with Russ Adams and we have his original business card here, which is actually better than a lot of original business cards. Don't so even. I wouldn't even Don't not. Even. Now let's be honest, I can't read the bottom two lines. Well, with, that's, perhaps that's with a magnifying print, glass. Todd. Yeah, That's the fine print. Oh. You're not supposed to. Yeah. I like that's exactly. the fine print. That's great. A little yeah. closer. Okay. Uh, I've got that booming voice. So I don't wanna... Russ Adams, the operations manager for um, Ogden's Uncon, which we'll talk about in just a second. But let's talk about you for a minute. Is that cool? It depends. I'm not running for president, so I guess we can go for this. I'm like probably the one from person in America that's not. Interested right in now. running? Yeah. Or? I mean, everybody just keeps coming out of the woodwork, but. Yeah. No, that's not going to happen here. No. I mean, I'm looking around us. your space right now, and there's yeah, the too nudity. many skeletons. Probably actual skeletons. There's actual, actual skeletons. skeletons. Yeah. 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 Uh, so we are on location at your studio. Um, what's the name of your company? Ogden Uncon. Oh, let's, are you talking about the special yeah, effects? Yeah, let's talk about company? special effects. Oh, let's talk so to you for a second. Escape Design Effects. I haven't said that in a while. Man. Escape yeah. Design yeah. Effects. So th has that been put on pause? Are you still yeah, doing some gigs? Yeah, it's kind of hibernating right now. I, I tried to do some gigs, but um, my my wife quickly re you know, made me realize that I can't do both at once She's right not now, seeing so. you as you're planning on con, so if you add on top of that. Yeah, so, yeah. It's, it's basically in hibernation right now. I mean, I think the last major project I worked on was probably not even that it was i think it was a gig for uh, a trade show for a company that was um local company uh, i want to say like um, a novelty size something yeah well it was it was a, a life size okay novelty in my opinion but the it was a really big grizzly bear you know and and so we had to build the forest and everything that went with it so it was Wait, just we know that the, company i think kodiak that, cakes yeah, kodiak yeah, cakes yeah, out yeah. Of park city yeah yeah yeah, have I have we seen the bear? Have you seen the bear? I hope not. There, the Kodiak Cakes has representation at outdoor retailer, I believe. Mm. So, yeah, maybe that's what yeah. they used it for. Yeah. Oh, I hope not, because they, they had no time. And this is the one thing. This is like the bane of my existence. Either the money is short or the time is short. And so they came to us with this with, with this thing. They wanted tw it was like twenty one days. We had to build these these pine trees, these giant pine like twelve foot trees. Which is only and, like a few days after like. I think God had more time than that oh, to make yeah, pairs. Yeah, I think so. You know, and so I had to sculpt this thing out of nothing. And the the, the thing is, is it was a really the, the bear itself was great, but the fur that we needed to make it look real, really realistic, was going to take something like fifteen weeks to get. I mean, and that's just standard, you know. And um, I like that. Randy, like, that. I like oh, that's just standard. That's Haircut. just standard. I mean, that's this just, is like 15 weeks. That. Everybody that's knows that. Haircut. Don't be a punk. Yeah, yeah exactly. you know that. What the hell? <laughs> so, so instead, we were we had like we had like no time to find fur. So we're buying stuff from Joann's and stuff like that, trying to piecemeal some fur together. And while it looked great on the bolt, when you put it on a giant creation like that, it just made it look like a big stuffed animal. So I was a little bit. You know, I was like, this kind of blows. You know, this is <laughs> this is a nice, this is like a representation of my work, exactly. and I see you know, that. yeah. So did they, they take possession? Oh yes, thank God. And then, and it's been about a year. They keep telling me they want to refer it, but 
to refer it, we're talking like eight grand easy, you oh, know, and easy. Yeah. And it's just sort of you guys are just I killing me. Like no well, idea. I have to go through it. I have to I have to pattern out this bear, which is essentially twelve feet tall. Oops, sorry, my bad. Um that was letting me know that you guys were gonna be here. Um so it was like twelve feet tall and it was it was really made to look you know, bulky. And so I had to pattern it whole thing out. And so I was like, this is, this is going to be, this is going to be costly. And, yeah. you know, uh, they, I think they've tried to get a hold of us a couple of times, but never brought the bear back. And so I was like, forward and onward. Yeah. I'm just forward sort of like, onward. at this point, it's been over a year. I'm just sort of like, yeah, I mean, you know, it's Kodiak cakes, right? So maybe just dip the whole thing in like syrup. Really? Yeah. <laughs> You just cover it in honey or something, you know, and some bees. And oh, I mean, we did our best to make it look realistic. It, it's just the fur, you know. The fur was just, you know, substandard. I mean, we, I think we bought something like three bolts of, you know, fur for this thing, and you know, it was with, just with everything I know about you, you're not about substandard bear fur. <laughs> Thank it's you, I not. appreciate it. Yeah, it. Uh, yeah, usually we would just be punching that stuff in with a needle, you know, and just sort of like getting it all in there, like we did with Bigfoot over there in the lion, you know. It's sort of like. I was just going to say, I'm, I'm taking photos of, of the podcast here, but if I turn around, there's no there's no lack of subjects here to, to no, photograph. No lack of um, There are people watching us. If, people in costumes. In costumes, yes. Yeah. I see 10 people. Yeah. It's probably a good idea. So, yeah. okay, so let's go back just a little bit further. Let's get to know you. Um, when did you start doing what you do? Were you, were you a kid? Yeah, pretty much. I, you know... I saw this. Ep this is my favorite story. Is like, you know, I, I was younger. I was way younger. I can't even tell you when. But um, I saw an episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood where he went behind the scenes of The Incredible Hulk. Oh, and nice. And you got to see Lou Trent. You know, because remember he was always into pretend and stuff like that. Oh yeah. So we wanted to show the kids that you know this was all pretend, and so they transferred, you know, transformed Lou Ferrigno into the Hulk with makeup and all kind of green paint and everything. And I was like hooked from that point on. You know, and I, yeah, I'm starting to learn all the processes because there was no YouTube back then. And, you know, you were just trying to figure out how everything went together. I don't, I don't even together. know how you did it then. Oh, it was, it was nuts. Because, I mean, now I, when I think about it, it's like, how in the hell did I do yeah. that? You know, because I, I would look at like Fangoria magazine and sometimes you get lucky enough in, in some of those, those periodicals that you'd be able to see a creature in progress. Did they have a, you know? like how to's every now and then? No, no how to's, really? but they did have like a shot of it, like maybe missing something so that you could kind of see a little bit behind the scenes mm. of what was going on and i'm sitting there with a magnifying glass just studying the hell out of it and after you know tens of thousands of dollars later you know i've gotten to the point where you know now i know what's going on and stuff but but yeah i i went through that all through high school and stuff and i was about to go to college i had a kind of a full ride to uh, the art institute of pittsburgh and i had to give that up because my grandfather was like telling me about how you know starving artists and stuff like that he's like you'd be dead on the street with a heroin needle in your arm or blah 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 that's so what we, i tell my students as that's the really? dream yeah. that's the dream yeah it's the dream the heroin needle but only if it's only if it's really cold and you know so you know i um I, I ended up giving up my my ride to uh, to go to the military, which I don't regret because I did have a lot of fun in the military. But you know, um, ten years after that, I get out and I decide, you know what, I'm going to try this again. And again, there he is. You know, you got to be an accountant or something. No, no, I listened to you the first time, and it wasn't until I was on the Henson show where he was watching me on television, and he he calls me up and he's like, you know. There might be something to this uh, this art thing after all, and you know I was pretty much just like f you old man, just you know just you know. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. So I was just getting ready to say, so was there a tear? And you're like, you went a different direction. Oh, I went a complete I'm different like, all direction. All I wanted to do was just please, Grandpa. No, I no. come from a Scottish family. We give each other the straight <laughs> truth. Yeah, you know sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it gives the old man a heart attack. You know what are you gonna do? <laughs> I mean, well, long I'm as I'm in the will. He saw some benefits, and so. Uh, from a child to uh, Henson's uh, show. And what was the name of that? Uh, Jim Henson's Creature Shop Challenge. Yeah. Creature Shop Challenge. Have you seen any of those, Brandon? No. I've, what the hell, Brandon? I mean, you guys, I've known you for a long time. You yeah. didn't even want to peek at the show that I was on? You ever listen to a podcast? Yes. Any of our podcasts? <laughs> yes, you bastards. I'm <laughs> I was, there, yeah. I was waiting for the no. And I go to, I I go to, to van it. sessions. Yeah. Yes, I mean, you do. You, yeah. Bastards. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, but don't this think is a one-sided friendship. You. Yeah. Oh my God! Uh, let's just say it's a little lopsided because I have seen what you've done. So, um, are they up so on YouTube? By the way, is that where they, you go? Where you, Jim Hans? No. no. Oh no, YouTube. Oh, are, are there you, any you of the can, episodes on YouTube? I think you can get them. I don't. I think have you, can have get you seen my after school YouTube. special on YouTube? 
You have an after school special. I have an after. So see, there's some miss. Okay. There's stuff well, missing this between is the us. first I'm hearing about. I that. understand that. I got one thing I'm yeah. known for, you know, besides that's swearing true. on national television. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's that's the only other thing I've got. But I can. But we can catch up on YouTube. Okay. Right. Yeah, okay. we can do that. Okay. And I think, like, I had to buy my own copies of the of the whole season. I mean, on the show or not. I had to wait 15 years until somebody uploaded that video, my after school special, to YouTube. Uh, see, I didn't know you were serious. It. I thought you've been I'm like screwing serious. with me no, right now. No. Now I'm gonna have to go find it. Yeah, you'll get a good laugh. Have a few drinks first, especially. <laughs> it's hyper dramatic. Oh, so, uh, you know, particularly we... like the German dubbed. Uh, the, what's it called? The words at the bottom. Oh, is it subtitled? Words. Subtitled. Oh, that's right. Yeah, subtitled. Yeah, yeah. It was that, subtitled. The, that's the one copy somebody found. Yeah. Oh my god. Had German god. subtitles, but it's it's all there, and that's all. It's after school. That's fantastic. Glory. So, what you yeah. like? A, were you a drink? You know, drunk uh, drunk kid. You know, I mean, were you abused? Were you you know were you molested? I mean, it was dramatic for so sure. So everything, all uh, of the above. You were drunk, molested. Track and, star uh, who lost a leg. Damn, that's that's cold, <laughs> man. <laughs> who then restored a. A Mustang, and I can't tell you what happens after that. With the parts from gets, your mechanical it, leg? It goes downhill. Nice. <laughs> nice. I, that, yeah. I don't know anybody that can say that as far as an after-school special. <laughs> I don't have that. God. That's like I feel an inadequate. part of pop culture for me growing <laughs> oh up. Oh, my God. Which were the after-school specials and that whole idea. I found the, Todd, so we have a new employee at the shop at Gear 30, and uh, she's been to like two or three shifts, and she says, Heard heard you were in a after heard you were in an after school special television show. I'm like, okay, h- how did you find out? Who told you? And it was someone who worked at an ex job of mine years ago, uh, who she ran into at the at the gym, and was like, hey, I'm working here now. Like, oh, Brandon works there. Ask ask him about the after school. Sp- so yeah, it gets like, apparently some. So why did you not go and it. do more after school specials? Uh, did you try? I think in my no this this let's bring it back around. In oh my, sure, let's take the focus off. In of. my head, <laughs> I had the same issue that you had. That but I don't know if I didn't really have a family member telling me like that's not a good way to make a living. But I but I had it in my head like I don't I don't know if that's good. I don't know if that's smart to pursue. Like that's not a good living. Like I should because if you don't yeah. make it, you're screwed. You know, blah blah blah. And so I should probably well, go were back. Were you the to main school. character in one episode? Not Still, like, that's that's. There's probably worse reasons that people dude, had yeah. to move from Iowa to L.A. or something, you know. So, and then I also thought, like, God, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of downtime on sets, right? Oh, yeah, and yeah. I'm like, twiddling my thumbs, and I felt like I can't, I couldn't do that. And then you look back, you look at people who like, who do uber well after being an actor in their entrepreneur stuff, like yeah. Ashton Kutcher or somebody, and they're like, oh shit, well that person did it right. You go make the money. And then you can go do be productive in yeah, society. Yeah. yeah. I had this weird thing. Like, I don't feel like I'm being productive in society sitting on a set all day. Hmm. I just I just like the sitting on the set. I, mean, <laughs> I just, you know, I've completely uh, down. I've just been an extra in a couple of things. And I'm like, this is fine. As yeah. long as there's, you know, you got some food. You get paid. You and, get food. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it depends on what you're doing as well. Because, like, you know, like I watched some, you know, some of the shows, um, uh, and, and you'll see the behind the scenes stuff and they'll be like the kids will be studying you know because they, they have, they're out of school doing right. the stuff yeah. so they're Tutors they're still things. doing their yeah their yeah. homework and stuff mm-hmm. like that and they're or they're or they're memorizing you know memorizing their lines but for us it was always cool because you were always building something because some asshole director was always trying to pull something out of the air that wasn't in the script and now super all of a sudden minute. yeah and so you're trying to create something at the last minute out of nothing basically and so it was always something, you know, something to do, you know. So now, um, have you always done sort of independent work? Have you worked for? No, we've done uh, d- lots of different projects. Um, it, it's been a lot of independent stuff, but you know, and and independent like you know, D- Danny Trejo film you know, films and stuff. No, and, I mean independent as in um, working for yourself. Oh or yeah, have you I've worked never, for other companies. The only time I've ever actually worked for another shop was the Hensons um, or when I'm hired um, by a company. Like uh, sometimes like when we worked on Pirates of the Caribbean, there wasn't just us. I mean, there were hundreds of people out there doing right. stuff. Right. I'd stick so. around for those credits. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you Company you after sort of, company. And- yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you you were there. I was there as escape design effects or, you know, I don't, I don't even think. No, I think it was straight up just my name. But you were, a, you know, there was an ultimate you know, um, company doing everything and you were a subcontractor, you know, and stuff. Right. So, I mean, 
So in that case, yeah, I mean, but I was still, you know, um, they would hire me to do something particular and, and you know, and we, we would be, you know, assembling it in the shop and stuff. Pretty much we were just an extension, you know, and it just depends on how, on how it, you know, you know, how it rolled out. But, you know, for me, it was, it wasn't, so owning your own shop isn't necessarily the way you even want to go because so many special effects artists are um, independent contractors, so they bounce from studio to studio. Right. You know, uh, yeah, just making sure, you know, like some days you might be doing, like you might be the fur guy on, on, on this project, and then two weeks, three weeks later, maybe even a month, you're over here and you're doing the sculpting for the beginning parts of this particular project. And then another time you'll be doing makeup and another time you'll, you know, you'll be, uh, you know, painting, you know, stuff on the 3D printers. So you don't get too and, attached. I remember when I was working yeah. for the Luminous, so we were just talking a little earlier, down in Salt Lake earlier, uh, a couple of the uh, effects artists that we worked with disappeared for a couple months at a time and would work on, I think one of them worked on one of the first iron man or something like that oh you know? yeah but just maybe a phase of it right yeah um and then another one would pop away for a little bit and come back and so it's just kind of a constant hustle and kind of moving it from really this place is. to the next and it's it's and it'll always be about who you know because uh, you know so one of the ladies on the show uh the jim henson show um she's a really good friend of mine her name's yvonne escato she she's been in in she was sort of the rock star of the entire show she was the one person on the show that it would, that everyone in hollywood knew if you were special effects because she had worked on everything i mean even as minor things she would you know but now she does these really big things like did you guys see aquaman of course. Okay, yeah. she did most of those those costumes. You wow. know, I mean, not alone, but she. I think she she headed up the project. Yeah. She seamed this Hellboy uh, suit for the new Hellboy. Built the arm. What? You know, this is yeah. not his chest. No, that is definitely not his chest. He is totally wrapped in foam. <laughs> so, you know. Um, and so, you know, I mean, so it just depends. You, you work your way. Sometimes you get lucky enough to, uh, and sometimes that's all it is is luck. You get lucky enough to uh, to be able to score. The, you know the, the the hero portions of the film but most of the time we're just working on some of the background stuff if people don't if you have somebody questioning the background stuff then no one has done their job so you know every little element of the film is uber important it may not just feel that way so you know depending upon what you're working on you may be like oh i'm i'm painting rocks well if those rocks don't look like rocks then yes. you haven't done your job you know yeah. so and if they're not able to get that camera up in there exactly to yeah. really see those rocks yeah which those those are some of my my favorite like I don't know just little Star Trek episodes and the older ones where you're like that does not look like a rock. Well, the yeah. rocks <laughs> bounce off the characters. Oh my god! Or the eye beam that suddenly somehow there's an eye beam in, built into the ship or something and and it's laying on somebody's chest and clearly it's styrofoam. The guy's breathing and it's slightly moving. It's like come on, can we do something? We weight it down with a sandbag on one end to at least kind of keep it, you know. Or but just hold your breath. Hold, hold your, your breath. damn breath. That kills me the most when you see dead people in 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 film. And clearly, they're still breathing because they couldn't hold it. And there's there's some uh, some. Uh, can you think of an? I'd love an, an an example. I would love to go watch one. That oh my god! Like, almost any of them. It's yeah. like they don't even try anymore. It's like no one teaches people how to be dead anymore on on, on a film because they're, 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 even when you hold your breath, your heart's beating, and sometimes you can see that. If they're not wearing, right. like, if they're not wearing a shirt or they're wearing a tight shirt or something, and it's like I can see his damn heart beating, you know, his, his rib cage is moving or whatever. And what what yeah. eyes do you have when you see a movie? Do you have the eyes that don't notice those things, or do you? I look try not to, honestly. I, I just want to get lost in the story. But the second something takes me out of the story and I don't know what it is, I begin looking for it, you know. And I'm like, and that's that's the biggest problem with CG that I have is your brain is telling you something doesn't quite you know measure up and you can't figure out what it is but the fact that you're out of it and trying to figure out what isn't what isn't quite right you've you've lost your audience I think, because i want to say uh it's a literary term but veris, verisimilitude does that sound right verisimilitude oh, hell on. where where you, case we need them where, yeah uh, where yeah. you are you know you're reading a book and you're fall, you're buying it all and so for me in uh lord of the rings i'm watching the you buy I'm, you buy all of it you buy the all the stuff going on, and then all of a sudden, um, Arrow Boy, what's his name, uh, Lo Leg Legolos or whatever his name is, <laughs> I don't know, but he's like, he's like, they're getting ready for battle, and he's running in a field, 
And this giant, uh, overgrown uh, mammal comes running by, like a rhinoceros thing. Mm -hmm. And he just and he reaches his arm out and grabs like a rope and just swings like backflips on. I'm, oh, and yeah. then all of a sudden, I'm out. I'm out. I'm like, yeah. in no world ever, even in the Lord of the Rings, would that yeah. ever happen? Or at least make it look like there's some kind of physics in there that would allow it to happen. But maybe because I mean. I mean, his his hair is barely moving, you know. I mean, he's just – and he's at this weird angle, you know, where it looks like he's being sucked through a wormhole or something. You know, it just doesn't – yeah, I mean, it's – come on. You know, think 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 these three things through. I, I'm not a fan of CG, I, you know, obviously because I'm, I'm a practical guy. But, you know, if, they, if they're used together, they work really well. But when you go CG heavy on something, it's sort of – in my opinion, it leaves people wondering – why doesn't this look right? You know, I mean, do you have to make that practical argument anymore? Is it always, you know, is it been, is it reintegrated yeah. back into film? A I don't bit think more it so. ever really kind of disappeared. So the, the, the real thing. So one of the big things about CG back in the day was when it started to take over a little more was that it was, it was less expensive and it was faster. But the problem was, you know, that it, it, it didn't become any, fa it actually takes longer now to do the CG. Maybe it's because they're trying to be, you know, more accurate in things, but like the movie Every Brave. Hair. Yeah. Yeah. So, like mo the movie Brave, hair in particular, her hair took them three years to develop. And it's like, cool. okay, I could have animated a goddamn wig in that amount of time you know i mean it's like you know we could have we could have done that on set you know um and it's way more expensive because now you have all these people who they're not just computer geeks you know and stuff coming into the these guys have like major degrees and things like that and they want to be paid for you know whereas before it might not have been as heavy you know and now if you change a scene in cg it takes all kinds of reprogramming to get that done whereas for us you just take the actor and move them a little differently. So it's like almost on the spot. Um, makeup doesn't really take that long anymore. I mean, yeah, there's an actor. You know, he could be sitting in a chair anywhere from, you know, three to six hours, depending upon how much makeup he's in. Like the new Hellboy, he, he's probably in there for a good, a good, you know, five to six hours, you know, trying to get into that suit, you know. But at the same time, you know, how long would it have taken them to completely – you know computer generate him and then not have the flexibility of changing anything on the fly you know mm -hmm. so because a lot of the stuff they keep in movies are accidents you know i mean you know like the, the the really cool little blip like that whole thing with um um uh dustin hoffman I, i'm trying to remember the name and name of the movie where he's he, he hits the taxi and he's like i'm i'm walking here i'm working here you know he hits it's really famous scene you know that was an accident the damn taxi driver yes. broke yeah. the barricade and just sort of like drove by and he never broke character he did his thing and walked off and you know and then there was even that little interaction between him and the cab driver and then they just kept shooting the scene that whole iconic scene was an accident that should have never happened but so you can't you can't have those fun little accidents accidents when everything is you know on a computer schedule you know so mm. i don't know that that's my opinion on it but well sort of as a child of the 80s i mean that was everything for me in a movie where you know those practical effects and so there's there's no question that i'm a fan i think a lot of kids maybe growing into cg don't appreciate it as much yeah. as i might but i think that even they feel that when they're taken out of it i think it's that important um you know what's fun is to go <clears throat> watch um uh, Planet of the Apes from the beginning, and and which how, one? The the series. So the very first one, and then just watch them all the way through because there's. Oh, we're talking the ones in the '60s and the, the '70s. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. From the beginning, all the way through. Yeah, sorry. So all the way because that's all costume, right? Yeah. And then up to however they're doing it, CGI mix or whatever now. Yeah. Um, and but pull, is that's a, that's a travel in, in how you improve like the looks of the, like it's crazy how that. Has Any of those old over the series that started in one world and is and now yeah. yeah, yeah. kind of lived up to this because you can't yeah. really do like uh, Jurassic Park because it kind of started in it's too it's not old enough they didn't well, of course if you go look at dinosaur movies in the sixties they're pretty the first Godzilla's. Jurassic Park had a yeah. lot yeah. of well you know there's a lot of that stuff in, in in uh, Jurassic Park that was practical oh, I mean yeah. yeah that that T Rex that was real I mean yeah. it was it was you know it was it was a gigantic you know you know animatronic robot you know and um, same thing with the, uh, the, 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 triceratops that was laying on the ground, you know, it that was sort was of cool. Like, yeah. yeah. There was just like uh, the puppeteers were up inside, probably a little bit below the floor. Breathing. Line, but, yeah. Breathing. Yeah. 
because he wasn't quite dead he yet. He wasn't quite dead yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you've, you've you've kept yourself busy. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of busy. Yeah. And so, how do you st- how do you get to a point as an artist where you decided one day that I can do this for a living? When did uh, that I, time come? Or were you hustling other things at the time? Were you working at restaurants when you got started? No, I. So. When I first got out of the military, obviously, you know, you know, bills needed paid and stuff. So I, I was working up at uh, a local, uh, you know, uh, manufacturer in Freeport, you know, and I had moved up the ranks. I started to I started to question I was getting in the in the five years I was there. I had started as as a, you know, a shift supervisor. And now all of a sudden I was a department head and I was like, I'm like, if I don't leave now. I'm going to be stuck here for the rest of my life. It's, you know, and while the pay was fantastic, you know, it wasn't enough to keep me wanting to go to work every day. You know, that's just the way it is. So I, um, a fluke happened and my boss was at the, he was just this piece of garbage and, you know, his, his hump of the week needed a job. And so I was out. You know, and that's how easily I was replaced. And that's why I never worked for another corporation again was, you know, because of stuff like that. So I decided at that point, you know, um, that I was going to go off on my own, that that was the that was the moment. And so I, I, I opened up my own studio, started out in my garage and just worked my way up until, you we know, had this conversation, the best businesses started in their garage. Really? Yeah. I mean, I, I think don't think there's a very special place. It's like a garage is, is like this magical cave, you know, and you can just <laughs> do so much with it. And so when people say that they're starting out and they're working out of their garage, I mean, those, are you know, it just happens that way and it's fun that way like I used to love rolling out of my bed and I could just walk in not, I don't have to brush my teeth or whatever I'm just walking into the Get shop out of your pajamas yeah, yeah not even that just walk out <laughs> into the damn garage and get to work you know where you know then I, I and I loved my studio so much in the industrial park um, but when I moved in there it was like a whole new world I mean yes I had to get dressed yeah I had to drive <laughs> out there it was like four miles away but once I was there I was like, I was like the king of that space, you know, no matter what, if I wanted to, you know, if I wanted to just, you know, burp my, you know, my way through the shift or, or whatever. And, you know, I could, I could yell and scream. And if I smashed my thumb on something, I could just let them rip. And no one was going to tell me boo about it because I was the, I was the guy, you know? And, and so, you know, and the only person that was going to let you go is you is me. Yeah. Yeah. And that's sort of the downfall, too, is because you you realize very quickly that you're responsible for everything. You're responsible that while that sounds fun, you're responsible for making sure that the customers are coming in as well as building, you know, a brand as well as building the product. You know, there's just so much that you have to do and it becomes, you know, it, it, could, it could crush you, you know, it could crush your soul, really. I mean, I as an artist, I wish that I could have just been able to just do my thing and then had somebody for me running things like that. That would have been perfect. Amen but to that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the goal for most of us. Yeah. I've had a couple of unsuccessfuls that were only unsuccessful because super strong on the technical side and on the, you know, the, the design side, but strumming in constant business, yeah. making sure things got paid, making sure enough was saved back. I mean, that's a huge part of being an artist oh, it on is. your own. Yeah. I mean, you know, and I had a logistics background a little bit, you know, and, and I actually enjoyed stuff like that. So, you know, making sure that all my stuff was cataloged and that I had all that stuff in, that was a little bit of a, that wasn't so bad, you know, okay. making sure that stock was always there. And, you know, I knew what the prices was, were. I was so, I was so anal about that stuff that I could tell you off the top of my head at the drop of a hat, how much, um, a single gram of silicone and what type of silicone would cost per you know per gram to make sure that we we we, <coughs> we could do a project. So, you know, it was like three cents a gram for this and two cents a gram for that. That's and incredible then, when the time came to do estimates. Oh though. yeah, wow. And, and so I, I could just you know I, I knew off the top of my head I could you know we could figure out what the mold was going to weigh and then at that point I or or the product was going to weigh and at that point I had a, a general idea, you know. So I mean that kind of stuff was you know became helpful but you know um also kind of boring when you think that you got you got this stuff in your head it's like pointless it's you know it's like i could easily just look this up why do i have this in my head you're you're kind of you're a social person though too so do you get you get lonely in your shop or? dude i am not a social person 
Like, well, you're not at all. Honest to God. Really? Like, I am the happiest when I'm all by myself okay. in the shop just going nuts. You know, um, I, I, I sort of don this character, you know, while I'm in public. Which and, is a good idea. For yeah, what you're yeah, exactly. And, you know, for being on television, it definitely helped, you know, but and I can always become that character I need to be in public. And then there's the, there's the me in, in, in private that, you know, like people like my um, my apprentice and, and my wife and, you know, and stuff like that. They're just like, you know, you're an asshole. You know, <laughs> it's like I can't I can't help it. I'm Scottish. I've got this, you know, my grandfather, we, you know, just, you know, he was always this type that even if it was a good day, he found something to bitch about. It was like, don't get too excited. There's always something going wrong, you know. And so uh, you kind of focus on that I catch myself doing and it's like Jesus Eugene survived in my bloodstream you know (laughs) it's like the cycle continues it does all right so when did Uncon become this thing in your head so I do have some experience with conventions I was lucky enough I started going out to the San Diego convention out there for I think I've, I've been about six or seven times but I it was probably after I got the job in that stop motion job at Luminous. Mm-hmm. And as a professional, I could get free passes to go out to San Diego. And so that's what probably started it because sometimes the whole process of getting passes for that is, is very difficult yeah. and everything. And so I think that's what got me out there for the, for the first time. But for me, more than anything, uh, and I grew up with a love of, of comic books. I was really big into comics in the in the early 80s and into the 80s a little bit. and uh, And then, of course, the love of pop culture and effects and I think that's one of the reasons I loved San Diego's Comic Con is because everybody would just send their current projects down from from LA and we get to see the full cast and the full thing and uh, and so as far as smaller conventions like so that's my idea of a uh, Comic Con, to, mm-hmm. to tell you the truth, right? I remember well, going yeah, to the founder. They created yeah, all yeah. of that. Everything that we do now. And I have some concept when I was younger, younger, of going to smaller conventions like at the mall or something, where I could buy some comic books and I could have some of my favorite comic book artists sign some pieces, things like that. But since San Diego's Comic Con, I have not um, made time to go even to Salt Lake's Comic Con, right? But I do know that Salt Lake's. Um, and, and that's a whole nother show. It's what what should I call the the Salt Lake Comic Con you Comic Convention? That okay. So that'll be another conversation. And so I haven't made it down there for that. Um, that's the PC version. Was was this idea of Ogden's Uncon brewing for some time? No, actually, it's funny. So all three of us sit on the same you know the same committee uh, for the city, the Ogden uh, Ogden, Ogden City, city. Advisory. Board. I do the same. Yeah. No, not even boards. Board, committee, Ogden or council or committee. Ogden or. City Arts Advisory Committee. committee. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I I hate the committee tra- is clearly safe in oh our hands. Oh my yeah. god! Yeah. I'm the chair. So. <laughs> You're the chair. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! So I guess it could be worse. I don't know. Um, we it could be me. You know that that would be a downfall for all of us. Um. So we were sitting in that committee, and you know how we go around at the end of the committee, we'll all talk about the projects that we're that we've got coming up. And uh, Scott Patria, who sits on the committee with us, he uh, is it Patria? I always say Patria, and now Patria. I want it. Okay, Patria, yeah. okay, good. Um, he was asking. He was like, "Why don't we have you know?" Because I'm always saying about, "Oh, I'm I'm going to 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 to, to Texas for this con, or yeah. I'm going to do this." And Scott's like, "Why don't we have one of those around here?" And I was like, "Well, you know, I'm I'm not sure why that is. I mean, we, you know, there's always the one you know south of us, but." You know, he's like, no, 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 for like Ogden, why don't we have something? And so I, you know, I, I started thinking about it. I was like, I, I don't know why we don't. And so I started crunching some numbers to see if it would work. And it would it, it would definitely work, you know. And um, so I, I, and then I just, I found myself pitching it to the city as their project. This this was something that I thought the city would want to take, you know, take on as, you know, like the corner, you know, the, mm-hmm. this really great idea that they've got, you know, I thought this would just be another one of those, right? And they're pretty much no, no, you know, it's yours. And and by the way, here's some money, and you know, go get started. And I'm like, you know, at that point, I was like, oh, you know, shit, you know, <laughs> it was like, so. And I had done up until about at this point, this was like September of 2017. Uh, we started the planning, and you know, uh, f- first thing was first, we booked the the Eccles Center, and you know, started doing all the stuff like that we really needed far to do. Out, though. Oh yeah, yeah, it was like 2 years ago. Yeah, we were we were like yeah, I mean it, everything started to come together really really fast and then 
you know, um, started working some things out. I had done by by this point that we're recording about fifty three, you know, Comic Cons as a celebrity guest in like the last five years, you know. So it's it's been a lot, you know. Yeah. And so I had some experience. But the cool thing about being a celebrity guest is you get to see all of it. I mean, yeah, you're mm-hmm. kind of pampered while you're there in most cases. But smaller cons, they kind of let you see things that are going on. Like I would sit in on their security briefings and stuff. Like mm-hmm. uh, Chicago's um, – uh, what was it? Uh, Midwest Fur Fest. You know, I was a guest up there, and they were just—they couldn't believe that I was just sitting there. They're having a staff meeting, and I was just sitting there watching their uh, their Taking security notes. briefing. Yeah, <laughs> and and so they're like, "You really find this stuff interesting?" Like, yeah, yeah. I kind of like to, to you know to, to learn the behind the scenes stuff. So, you know, I, I learned That's all smart. this. That's very well, smart. Well, yeah, yeah. And, and sometimes you can't even help it. Like if you're sitting there and you'll hear fans bitching about something about the con that didn't work that they can't believe they implemented and it's actually affecting you know the attendees and so you hear that and it's like oh well i guess if i had a con i wouldn't do that and you just sort of these mental notes you know Mm -hmm. so that's kind of how it was it was born out you know and then you know and now we're like what 60 days away you know, I vomit every morning and you know it's sort of like <laughs> we're getting close man we're like ah oh. so this has truly been your full-time gig for a little while for now. two years now yeah I mean basically you know the first year we were putting things together so I was able to work on you know uh, escape design effects projects and stuff um, but yeah I'd say for at least for the last year and maybe a couple of months it's been 100 percent full-time. And when I say full time, I'm not even joking. I'm I'm working on this from 7 a.m. when I get up until 3 a.m. when I finally go to bed. I mean, if it's not graphics that we're doing, it's, right, right. But we're gonna, you know, we're gonna see that though. Though everyone who goes is gonna notice that, you know, because they should pick up on the little, <laughs> the little things like you said that you've been able to gather mental notes along the way. Um, which I'd love to, I'd love to know an obscure one if you have one, um, but uh, that you that you're able to implement into I think the uncon. I think one of the big ones for for most people were they would go to to, to cons like the one in the south, for, you know, south of us. They and a VIP ticket, they sell just as many of those as they do a regular, you know, three day pass or four day mm-hmm. pass or whatever it is, you know. And so the whole feeling of being being a VIP becomes nothing. I mean, if everyone, if you're buying a VIP ticket so that you can line jump and you can get preferred seating and panels and stuff, that's great. But if there are 20, 50, 60,000 of those people, you know, all you're standing in a line regardless. Yeah. So what we did was we said, okay, well, we're hoping for between, you know, 3,000, 6,000, 10,000 people, whatever. We're only going to make or available 300 VIPs, and that'll be it. Once it's done, it's done. And so that way no one could possibly wait in a line for very long. And if you line jumped, you might be the only person in that line, you know. So, you know, you're not, you're not running a cattle farm at that point. You know, your, 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 your attendees are getting a, con, you know, a convention, a real convention experience. They're having fun. They're not waiting, you know, for two hours you in still, line. You still have any VIP tickets left? Uh, you know what? I think we have a few left. I mean, so they they were selling. They were yeah, they yeah. were they were going. They were screaming. As a matter of fact, it was the number one thing that we were selling. You know, um, and then one day passes started coming up, and I was like, well, that seems kind of like a, you know, why would you buy a one day pass? Well, it's probably somebody who wanted to just kind of get a taste of something that they hadn't done before, and so they would buy a one day pass, and they'll probably buy you know a three day pass after that or whatever. But but yeah, it was uh, lines waiting in lines to get three seconds with a celebrity that you that, that you kind of admire was not worth it for most people. They, they would complain about that most of all. So what we did was we limited ticket sales and we limited the availability of things like VIP passes so that you got more time with those celebrities. Um, and like one of the other things was photo ops. You get three seconds Three seconds. They, they'll bring you in. You take the photo. Three, you leave. two, one, done. Boom. And you know that's you, tighter than Disneyland with Mickey. I'm really. You. I'm yeah. telling you. You know. <laughs> so for us, you know, I know it doesn't sound like much, but we've worked it out so that you have 21 
to, to 25 seconds, which if you think about it, as you're clicking that off and we're having this conversation, that's probably five seconds. We'll keep going. I mean, there's actually a decent amount of time that you can say hello and keep things mm -hmm. going and stuff. We're still not up I to 25 you seconds this, yet. And, I mean, you can at least say something. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Try and, and build and the photo a tiniest op. bit of rapport at all. Exactly. Yeah. And then we limited the availability of those. So there's mm -hmm. only ever going to be 100 photos with the, the, the captains of the black sails. Or, and I think the most photo ops that we have available are for Hellboy, um, for, um, uh, for David Harbour, which are 400. Once those are gone, they're gone. So you're not going to wait in line all day. I mean, because we're only letting people in the line who have you know, already purchased those photo ops. So, you know, if you, if you don't have one pre-purchased, you know, you, you know, there's not going to be any available of the, you know, the day. So there's no reason for you to be in line, you know, so. So it's know. Ogden Uncon. The dates are June 7th through 9th. What makes it an Uncon? Well, we kind of branded it after the city. So, you know, we were kind of going for that whole, you know, still untamed thing. So uncon is unconventional. It's untamed, you know. And so we were bringing in, by being unconventional, we're doing these things that other cons don't do. You know, we're giving you more time with celebrities. We're limiting ticket sales. We're trying to make the con experience more, more fun for you. Um, and then we're bringing guests that wouldn't normally be seen anywhere else. Like Sophia the Robot has never been seen anywhere else at a Comic-Con, and she's appearing at ours is the very first one she's doing. Same thing with Amy Hill and Max uh, Jenkins. He's the new Will Robinson. This is his first. You know, um, we're pulling from genres that uh, – that are not just the next Marvel movie, you know? So, you know, we're going to have some, you know, like guests like um, uh, next year, I, I don't want to, I don't even want to ruin it, but it's a hip hop star, you know? And so, you know, we've got, you would never see these people at comic cons because why no one thinks about that. All the, all the, all the con promoters think about is, is the next Marvel movie. Well, you know, and that's the other thing. If you've seen them anywhere in Utah, you're not going to see them at, at Uncon because we won't have people who have already been here. We're looking for people that have never been seen before. So, you know, they're coming to Ogden for a unique, unconventional experience. And because we're doing things 24 hours, you know, we've gotten that whole untamed thing where we have all these parties and pub crawls and all that stuff. You know, it's like the whole, the whole town's going to be involved in this. That's what we're hoping. Yeah. yeah. We're trying to essentially turn, you know, Ogden's 25th Street into, into the Comic-Con, so. You spent two years planning and preparing for this. Um, one, one, it better be damn good, Ross. And two. <laughs> no pressure, yeah. <laughs> and two, are you, is this, is this a one-off? Are we, you thinking of next year already? It like, all depends on the turnout. I mean, yeah, we are thinking about next year. Okay. Um, like some of the things, this is another thing, okay, I'm going to kind of throw this back out there. One of the things that make us unconventional are the fact that we're actually trying to help out our, our local artists. So we have these things called artist helping, uh, sorry, artist helping hand programs. Like we're bringing in this pitch fest writing contest. So we have all of these publishers from around the country you know, coming out to to essentially allow you to pitch to them so that they can help you critique your query letter, your marketing plan, because now Very if you cool. write a book, you have to have a marketing plan, you know, um, so they help you critique that. They help you get ready. And you know what? If you impress them while they're there, you've just had a one on one with a couple of publishers. And that's not something that anyone can really say nowadays unless you you have money or you're you're uber famous or whatever. Uh, another one is the Real Guru Experience, where she's a Hollywood uh, casting uh, producer. Uh, sorry, casting director. And so they're going to do, you know, really quick um, workshops on how to uh, audition in front of a casting director and um, things that you should know and, and that you should do. This, this, this is my chance. Be good for you. This is your chance. This is yeah. my chance. I'll get back in the swing you of things. You know what? Here. I, would, yeah. I would die if Katrine was actually involved in that problem, you know, that project that you were, that you were, what's uh, that her, you did. What's her name? Katrine McGregor. It, well, it was her. Seriously? I'm not kidding you. Are you kidding? She's out of Salt That's Lake, awesome. right? awesome. Yeah. Well, no, she's now in Boise. Okay. Yeah. Well, she was out of Salt Lake. But yeah. Yeah. She was for years. She, she, uh, she's who said go. You go try. Yeah. She Every recommended time. Me a lot. <laughs> it's the smallest damn world, man. I mean, are you? But yeah, yeah. Katrina McGregor's yeah. running. Oh, yeah. She oh, runs no, Real Guru, sure. and yeah. she's going to be coming to do that. I'll actually, I'll hook you up with her because she oh, probably cast you in the first place. That's awesome. Now yeah. you're going to have to pull it up on YouTube to remind you. You know what she casted was um, before Danny. Oh, I can't remember his last name. Who was in that '70s show? 
Master scene. Master scene, yeah. Um, so what it was was, and I was an extra in this one because I didn't get the part. Um, but I was an extra with Danny Masterson, and we filmed. I think up it was up at Snowbird or something. It was supposed to be Baywatch, but in the mountains and in the snow. And they did a pilot, oh and the pilot God. aired right after the Super Bowl one year. So we, we, I didn't get this. I had audition for a bad guy. I didn't get the part, but I was, it was an extra, and um, and and I, I had to learn how to smoke. I didn't know how to smoke. I had to learn how to smoke a cigarette and, and do the club scene and stuff. But yeah, the scene was with Danny Masterson, and she, she, I know for sure she did that one. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. that's fantastic. So yeah, well, so when she gets here, I'll I'll reintroduce you to it's her. Pretty so. wild. Yeah. So, sure so she has no idea that was. Oh no, years she ago, she. Yeah. You'd be surprised who she who she remembers, and it's weird because we'll like I'll I'll have lunch with her or something. We'll be sitting there, and she likes to put people on speaker when she's talking to them on the phone. Mm-hmm. So we're sitting there having lunch with a friend of mine, Crit uh, uh, Killen, and he's another special effects artist that's local. And we're talking to her, and she hits the button suddenly, and we're having a conversation with Todd Bridges, and he's bitching about <laughs> something. On, I'm like, this is the weirdest damn thing. <laughs> She's just connected. She's uber connected. Oh, wow. But- so we're doing that. So the Real Guru experience, they're going to teach you how to audition in front of those casting directors, but there's a competition involved where you're sort of auditioning for her. So she's going to pick like one person from each age group that she's setting up to, to actually appear in one of her projects. So, you know, these are all benefits. And so next year we're planning the same thing with like a fashion community and with the music industry, you know. So every year we'll do a different artist helping hand program, you know, to try to help out our local uh, talent. So now how do you sign up for those? Um, for those. Is it a separate thing? Is it through? Yeah, the... it's sort of it, some of them are free and some uh-huh. of them aren't like, for, you know what? Right now, everything is free. So if you have a ticket, you're automatically in there. If you wanted to submit something for the Pitch Fest, it was like it was like a filing fee of like ten dollars or something like that. It was minimal. It was essentially just to help us, you know, print and pay some people to help us, you know, you know, put the the collate and stuff. So, um, you know, that that was really minor. But I mean, it you know when you know that you're about to to talk to a you know an actual publisher, and we've got three of them coming out. So. Not to mention, um, one, two, three, three published authors um, with with significant pieces like um, Jay uh, Bonnet Singer, who uh, wrote all of the uh, the Walking Dead novels. So, oh wow! Yeah, and Jay is an incredibly personable guy, you know, and so people can you know ask him questions and get their books signed. I'm sure they have a copy of them, you know. I mean, just you know, just stuff like that. I mean, stuff that that. A normal, I guess you would call a normal convention, wouldn't do or didn't wouldn't care enough to do for local artists. So uh, maybe that's the benefit of being an artist and 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 running this. So you can meet Hellboy. Yeah, he hasn't been to Salt Lake. No, no, we snagged him before Salt Lake got him, oh. and uh, we um, also there is this isn't on the flyer, but um, you remember Scott was really excited about this in the meeting, um, that Ogden meeting. Uh, we announced. Um, uh, Cybertronic Spree, which is he was re- really excited. I was about like it. really yeah. surprised, yeah. you know, because I was like, you, none of you guys are gonna know who this is, because unless you're like a Transformers fan, because they dress up like the Transformers from the '80s cartoon, and it's the band, and so you don't know who these people are in real life. They're just, you know, you know that that's oh, that's the pink Transformer. I can't remember her name. And there's all their sound wave or shock waves over there, and and you know, and then you've got the original um, Bumblebee, you know, the 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 you know the beetle you know uh-huh. and and so they and, and and they're actually badass i mean like you you listen to them and they are they are crazy good and so they'll be performing uh you know uh, june 8th at the at the con so all right that was ross i could talk to you all day that was a quick 50 minutes right there um holy crap i need you give me a, your last your 30 second pitch on why everyone should get tickets to ogden Uncom. Why you should get Ogden? Because what are you a punk? You know, I mean, are you a goddamn punk? I that mean, was only no. four yeah, seconds. Four seconds. Yeah, See, good. I think I got to the point. No, buy a ticket because when you buy a ticket to Ogden Uncon, you're not only supporting our convention and our future years, you're supporting local artists and you're supporting the economic, you know, you know, an economic impact of downtown, you know. Um, you know, in so many ways, and the community, because, you know, Ogden deserves to have something fun like this that comes around every year that people are really excited about and getting ready for and stuff. And then the businesses, I mean, think about how much it helps the businesses downtown. You know, we've got, you know, we, we did an, uh, what was it, uh, 
independent economic impact report on just 3,000 people, and it was going to be $700,000 of economic impact to the city of Ogden. That's, that's incredible, you know. I mean, that's not coming to us. You know, that's going straight downtown to local businesses. I mean, just imagine every year that, that, that that's the possibility. So for, for no other reason, buy a ticket for that, you know, for that reason. So help support the community. Awesome. Oh, what a nice selfless way to finish the show. <laughs> I try. <laughs> There's like one little tear. There's a little tear. Oh, well, my eye or your, that, that, that's right. dust. You know? <laughs> Plus part of me is thinking and that it's like a, it's a, it's an effect. It's not and it could be. I, gotta, I, I might have tear sticked him. Yeah. I totally tear sticked him. Well, thank it. you so much for your time. Let's do this again sometime. Definitely. Anytime. Yeah, thanks, Russ. Thank you, Russ. Making that way. Well, once again, we can put a bow on it. That's going to be a wrap for episode 14 of the Nine Rails Arts Podcast, produced by the Banyan Collective, arts and adventure podcasting since 2010. Don't miss an episode of the Banyan Collective's Nine Rails Arts Podcast as we explore what it means to be an adventurous creative in 2019. You can hear the stories of Ogden's new Nine Rails Creative District, including those of the district's epicenter and home of artisans, designers, creatives, and our future home, uh, within the Monarch Building. The Monarch Building. Follow the Nine Rails Arts Podcast on Facebook. Also on Instagram at the number nine for Nine Rails. For more from the Banyan Collective, simply search the Banyan Collective on iTunes, Spotify, and yes, on YouTube. This week we'll leave you with a little something from our Van Session Season 2, a ditty from local hip-hop band Grits Green. <laughs> yeah, so I, man, I've been ideas. wanting to play Womp There It Is for years, and these guys are like, no way, man. I Maybe swear, we that, need that some of that right it. now, right? Womp There It Is, man. <laughs> Tag team back again. Oh, all right. Let's hear track number three. Okay. Four chairs, four chairs, four chairs, four chairs. Watch your feet, you're dancing on the edge I'm trying to think, what happened to your head? Half of it is dead, and the other half can't think And now it looks like somebody's grabbing your seat Show teeth, growl like a beast I'm a monster named Fred, man, I ripped this track to shreds I commit murder lyrically with the mic Big bodies everywhere, I'm just keeping y'all alive for the party Line after line, number, rhyme after rhyme You can tell after time, you'll find I'm on my grind It's becoming more clear to me, things ain't what they appear to be Trust when you hear from me, they don't put Certified wordplay, like my heart, I throw the key away. So, hey, can't enter. There's only love inside to share with everyone. So, cherish life, y'all, and live. Cherish every moment, man, and live. It's a give. Come on. Four chairs, but there's one left standing. Ha. Four chairs, but there's one left standing, right? Four chairs, but there's one left standing, right? Four chairs, four chairs, cause we line them up just to knock them down. Ha. We line them up just to knock them down. That's right. We line them up just to knock them down. Ha. We line them up, yo. We line them up. Ah. I tested the water and found out how deep Life's not fair, but who really cares when you're facing the heat? Pinpoint the problem and suffer an accuracy And keep on moving everybody with dynamic speed The quickest way I don't give a shit huh. Spit loud and clear over a grimy beat Walk up to the theater, move your meat, lose your seat I'm Roger Nettie's AKA, Marshall Jones I'll slam you in the face and smash you silly clones that's right. Bones and fat lips, cause uh, four chairs, but there's one left standing. Oh, uh, four chairs, but there's one left standing, right? Four chairs, but there's one left standing. Uh, four chairs, uh, four chairs, cause we line them up just to knock them down. Uh huh. We line them up just to knock them down. That's right. We line them up just to knock them down. Uh, we line them up. Uh, we line them up. Yo, I'm not a Martian, I'm a human being. I use 40% of volume to oil the machine With the inner gigabytes of memory A perfect circle A finely tuned apparatus program to think globally See, it's all about the passion You're giving it And we gon' keep on rapping Until you wish we quit And you can keep on swinging But girl, you're missing it uh-huh. Quit moving for the future This is it Quit moving for the future Another rhyme scheme. We all original. We do our own thing. Time is now. Time is now. Thanks for listening. Turn off your big screen. Turn in the big screen. This is it. This is it. Another rhyme scheme. We all original. We do our own thing. Time is now. Time is now. Thanks for listening. Turn off your big screen. Turn in the green screen. For Line them up just to knock them down. How we do it? We line them up.
just to knock him down. What we're doing? We line him up, hey, we line him up, boom. We line him up just to knock him down. What we're doing? We line him up just to knock him down. How we doing? We line him up just to knock him down. What we doing? We line him up, hey.